to this. So it's going to be, have to be a very careful process of what, what, what we're looking at. But we are addressing this by two papers because we need to spell out what does professionalization mean, what do we mean by demilitarization. Um, there was a question on the relationship of the MECs and the uh, executive. They are quarterly MINMEC meetings every, every quarter, rather. So, so the MECs from all nine provinces do meet with the minister and they do raise issues. So pr prior to the meeting, they, they send in their reports, their, their issues from the provinces, and the minister sits with the police commissioner and the uh, secretary of police and they address issues. So though there is a relationship. Um, I spoke to police counseling and the EHW program. Um, there was an issue raised about control of firearms. We, in the past financial year, we started a very big project together with the Wits, uh, Wits University. We're looking at the management of firearms, but also the impact of the legislation of 2001 and whether that has had in any impact. So we, we're finalizing the project at the moment. We, we're hoping to have the results in the next few weeks. We have a presentation by WITS next week to us. We've had previous presentations already. But on top of that, under the auspices of the ministry, there is a big project also in looking at firearms management, and it's spearheaded by the Ministry of Police. So there's, there's a lot of work being done uh, around the responsibility and management of, of using firearms from the police side, but also what can we do. Um, and we've added that into the paper also, that we, we look at management of, of legal firearms and illegal firearms. Um, in terms of, there was a question on corruption. Yes, we are addressing it. If you see, there's a new chunk in the paper on, on talking to, the, uh, to integrity and corruption, but also there's this, um, under the auspices of DPCI, there's an anti-corruption task team, but it's a whole of government approach. So they are, they is, they are, there is work currently being done on, on, on corruption. Um, intensify awareness campaigns. I think I've, uh, I've noted that point. Um, professionalization of the SAPs, I've spoken to that. W will it include changing of the ranks? Our paper on demilitarization is looking at that currently. You know, wh wh what do we mean when we speak about demilitarization? Is it, is it just an approach? Is it, is, it, um, is it a mindset of change? Or is it actual rank? So hopefully in the next few weeks we should have a paper on, on, on demilitarization that will speak to this point precisely. Um, Excessive force, does it include lethal force? Ma'am, we just finalized a paper on the use of force. It's actually a very good paper. It's something we would at some point maybe come and present to the, um, to the, to the committee. And it talks about the responsibility of SAPs in using force. Lethal force is the last option with, from in SAPs. You know, it, it should not be a first option. So we look at that, but we're also looking at the force continuum. So the paper uh, addresses quite a lot of issues that are concerning people at the moment. So we do have a paper which we can forward to you. We just need to send it to the minister first and do a presentation to him. Um, it's nice to be able to see we do have papers. Um, the regular re release of crime stats. Um, Yes, we are. We're not, we're not vague in the paper. We, we, maybe, Secretary, you can assist me with answering this question on the release of the crime stats. Um, yeah, welcome to the Acting Secretary of Police, Mr. Niba Fure, and also I see Mr. Joey Atebe of the Presidency of the NDP. Welcome to him as well. Ms. Fure, you are welcome to you know, come in at any stage. Um, thank you, Chair. Maybe I can let Ms. Omar complete, okay. and then any additional things I can then comment on. Thank you. Ms. Wilmar, you can continue. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, there was a question on, on the audit of trends, and is the NASCOM working with experts? Currently, we are aware that the, 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 uh, the South African Police Service works together with the stats essay in releasing the crime stats, but it's also got MOUs with uh, quite a few of the universities which includes UNISA, the University of Pretoria, CSIR. So in terms of um, working with experts, I think they do engage experts on, on, on this. Um, I think I answered uh, Honorable Carla Barnard's question on protecting the police against assassinations. It's an employee health and wellness program. In terms of whether 2011 plan protecting the police is being rolled out, I think that is part of the EHW, but I, I stand to be corrected. So um, just. It's not something I followed up on, so. Um, uh, 
Um, there was a question on the appointment of the provincial commissioners. Have we looked into this and then the crime intelligence provincially? Um, what are the requirements, whether the requirements have dropped? Um, Honorable member, I think we, we, uh, in reference to the last slide that we spoke to when we were doing the audit of, of, the, of the police, um, it's, it's, it's a point we want to look at, but it's also a, f a project we're flagging for the next financial year, looking at crime intelligence and also um, the requirements and the, whether the members there are appropriately placed. Um, I think I've answered the question on demilitarization. Um, Falam, Secretary, I think you'll want to answer that question in the Falam. Yes, we have looked at the paper and provided the Secretary with comments. So I think that's it for me, Mark. Do you want to add something? Ms. Furi. Thank you, Chair. My apologies for um, arriving late. For me, I thought the inputs will, were very valuable. It will assist us in enhancing the document. So as indicated by Ms. Omar, we, um, I think definitely the, the white paper is silent on the element of employee wellness. So all the aspects around employee wellness that was raised here, as much as um, SAPS has strategies that speak to it, I think it's useful. it would be useful for us to just put some broad outline in the policy in the area where we're talking um, around the approach to policing. The, the, and then likewise, as to Munmik is there, but I don't think that we've explicitly indicated in the institutional arrangements. The, at an at a operational level, we know that there's MINMIC and the purpose of MINMIC, but in the institutional arrangements, I think it could be enhanced, including the relationship between the MEC and the provincial um, commissioner. Now, the two elements that, that's controversial and that we had deliberately kept vague was the issue of, of the national board as defined in the NDP and points that were raised in this room with regards to the appointment of, of senior, like your national commissioner, your deputy commissioners, um, your divisional commissioners. So we haven't yet found a, a way to capture that need without undermining the constitutional responsibilities that is conferred to the president. So that is one section that we need to explore a bit further and we're very open to ideas. Um, I, I hear Chairperson's recommendation also that we build in a role for, for Parliament because we, we have a role for, for Parliament in all <laughs> other um, the appointments of all, of all other high-ranking officials within the public service. So maybe that is certainly something that we could consider. The other thing also that we deliberately kept vague because it's a political decision was the, the element of information. I think there's a, a, a general appreciation for the, for the need that statistics needs to be released more timelessly. And at various levels within SAPS, um, they even sometimes release the statistics to communities um, in, in, in the engagement in CPF meetings. However, it hasn't, the position of the annual release of statistics has been taken by cabinet. So currently we feel a bit constrained in, in how we, in, in making it a definitive communication. You know, to, we, we're not saying statistics must be released weekly. Instead, what we're saying is that there is a need for statistics to be released timelessly if we want to optimize community participation um, in, in crime prevention and safety, and if we want to optimize intelligence-driven policing, then we need to have the statistics more regularly, and it needs to be more current. Um, how it's going to unfold then in, in, in terms of absolute timelines will have to be determined by cabinet. Right, right second round and also follow-ups of those. Um, I'll start here, Honorable Mulabatsi, and then we'll go that Thank, route. Thanks, Chair. Is it timelessly or regularly? Which is which? Thank you. 
Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, Chair, I think we, we had enough of the, the presentation, uh, which I think it's, it, it's, it's, it's dominated by theory. That is how I understand it. Because until we see the action plan to say, this is what we have, this is what we are going to do to remedy this one by this time, and so on and so on, so that we do not leave those Molanyana things to cling together until they become a mountain. Then it's then that we start to act. So I think the action plan as well is it's very important so that we, we know exactly what is going to happen when. Thanks, Chair. I think Chapter 6 speaks to that, in a certain extent, the implementation phase, but again, it's dependent, of course, on the legislative imperatives and when that will be finalized. But thank you for that point. Anybody in the back row? Let's go to the front row. Yes. Yeah, looking, looking um, at, at the actual draft white paper, um, the, there is a, a, a sentence here that says on page 41, a division for municipal and traffic police must be established within the SAPs. Um, now, to my mind, that has massive financial implications for municipalities because speeding fines, parking fines, all of that go, of course, into the municipal coffers. And now there's a suggestion in that line that that should just be removed. So I think, um, I, I don't know why it's even being contemplated. Each metro handles its own police um, traffic <clears throat> and municipal entities. So, so what is the possible thinking of duplicating the process or attempting to take finances away from municipalities to put them into the SAP's coffers. I, I don't understand. I don't even know that that would be legal. Honorable Mbele. Right, is that the input? Right, let's get the responses and then we'll go to the presidency in terms of the next presentation. Right. Um, Chair, if, if you'll allow, I'll respond. Um, we, we note the need for an action plan. The kind of, um, yes, that is the separation between us and SAPS, because we do the broad policy and they do the strategy and the operations, but we do work very closely. And we'll engage the National Commission that is to, for a copy of, of um, the the implementation plan of the white paper. And then regular versus time is, uh, I think I put myself in the corner there because I think from the Secretariat's perspective, we would like it to be both regular and time is. Um, currently we're getting it regularly, we're getting it annually, and, um, but some of the opinion that it's not timeless enough because by the time we get it, it, it doesn't always allow for um, rapid intervention, but it is very good for trends analysis. So there's, there's advantages to having it regularly and not necessarily timelessly. Um, it gives us time to, to see what the patterns are and when, when interventions can be done. But from our side, we would, we would we would appreciate if, it, if, if both happened. Um, but currently that is not in our control. Then with regards to the division within SAPS, the role of that division, if, we, if we're saying a single police service and we're saying that it's primarily um, a, co coordination, a better coordination across the three spheres of government, then the role of that division is not at all to be looking at um, the details of the operations of, the, of, of municipal police, for an example, or even the, the details of the 
collection of, 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 of revenue. It is more a regulating setting. So we're saying it's going to be this board. Um, the function of the board is going to be to ensure that there's uh, national standards and um, common, common or regulations at a national level that is ensuring uniformity with regards to specific operations. But it's, it's just about standardization, and, and that division is just going to be to ensure the coordination of that standardization. So the financial implications won't be for the municipalities, they won't be adversely affected, but it will be for, for the national department, and they have taken it into consideration. Right, members, we will, of course, during the course of the morning, come back to the document because we will get the presentations from civil society and, of course, next Tuesday when we deal with the other white paper, there will also be opportunity again to engage. So thank you very much. Mr. Joira Tebe, welcome to you. You're welcome. You're welcome to join us in front. Or do you prefer the middle? Yeah, I, I don't have a particular yeah. presentation to make, just to... To, to make the remarks that uh, we have been involved with the process of the development of this white paper at the JCPS cluster level. And I think there have been many iterations of, of this paper. We also uh, made recommendations to Cabinet that it be approved for further processing uh, by, by Parliament. So, in a sense, the matters that are contained in the reflect the views that we've expressed throughout the process of its de development. I think, I think the critical thing that I've always raised is the issue of the injunction that comes from the NDP of demilitarization. And I've always asked, to say you must demilitarize, you must say, what, what do you mean when you say the police is militarized? Because the NDP does say, in fact, the mere use of ranks do not, does not in itself amount to militarization. So, so it's, it's a good thing that a paper is being developed to unpack, and I heard, I heard the members also saying that there needs to be clarity on what is meant by that, by that uh, demilitarization. So, it, I mean, it's, it's, it's a process that I would welcome so that we work on. So we understand what, what we mean thereby. Uh, from, from a memory, I think that the two things that could have led to this classification First, the introduction of these ranks, and secondly, certain utterances with regard to the need for the police to, to, to defend themselves, and phrases such as shoot to kill. Uh, those may have led to the perception that the police is now militarized, but strictly speaking, the use of force has always been, by the police, has always been permissible within the bounds of, of the law, of course. Now, that's why I'm saying for me, it would be useful to have this paper developed on demilitarization so we know exactly what elements of that demilitarization must we, uh, we must focus on. But in general, we support the process. Uh, let me just say that initially when they started, they came with a paper on safety and security. And the cluster was saying, no, no. When we looked at the paper, it seemed to focus solely on the work of the police. We said, but safety and security is broader than the work of the distance. And then the decision was then taken that we should then develop this white paper on policing, as well as the white paper on, 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 on safety and security. So we've been intimately involved in the process. And as I say, uh, what is contained in, 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 in the document is things that we have supported. But of course, I think that they're very useful uh, uh, points that have been made which will enable the enhancement, as, as Ms. Furry is saying, the enhancement of the document. Thanks, Jim. Thank you very much for that input. Any observations, questions? Uh, Secretary? Acting Secretary. Chair, my apologies, just to take us back slightly, but I think it's, it, it's, it's necessary. On, on your question on the Farlem Commission, as, as Ms. Omar had indicated, yes, we did an analysis, and we thought that the, white, the two white papers <coughs> would assist us in a response to some of the issues raised therein, and then as well as, as she had indicated, the use of force policy, which um, it unfortunately has to still go through the 
full consultation process before we, we can bring it to, to Parliament, but we certainly will bring it for your consideration. But then there's also, um, we did an assessment of the implications and, and, and the need to establish, the recommendation for the need to establish a task team. And so we've put a recommendation to an international or a, a, a panel of both international and, and, and domestic experts. So we've, we've submitted that recommendation to the minister and um, we're saying that an internal task team must be established and we were volunteering to, to drive that process and then to design the terms of reference so that we can begin um, we can expedite the, the implementation of the recommendations, but Minister, as he is on the program, so I'm sure he will elaborate on that. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Uh, the Minister will be coming to us on the 26th of August regarding the recommendations and the implementation plan. Thank you for that. Um, our next um, speaker would be uh, Dr. Gareth Newham from the Institute of Security Studies. He's very much welcome to come to the front bench and replace the Secretariat. Um, and he'll be, he'll be the next uh, input from civil society. Welcome, Gareth. Thank you very much, Chairperson, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to address the committee. We really appreciate um, our engagement with you. Um, okay. Oops, sorry, there we go. Okay. Um, as you mentioned, my name is Gareth Muir. I head what's called the Governance Crime and Justice Division at the Institute for Security Studies. Um, we really welcome the work of the Police Secretariat on the White Paper. We think it's a very valuable uh, to have a policy framework that can help guide policing so that both the public and the police know what's expected of them and where they're going. Helps general provide an ethos and orientation for policing. And I think if we're talking about new law, which is often really important when you're talking about police reform, it can provide very concrete direction into the kinds of legal pre prescripts that the police can uh, start thinking about putting in place to help really strengthen and improve the work that they do. I'll be talking a bit about um, that, but also looking at some of the key issues. There's a lot of issues with policing, and obviously we have a limited amount of time. Um, so just going to be focusing on a few things. From our perspective, the issue of strengthening police leadership is important, uh, promoting police integrity and tackling corruption, training for impact, uh, improving officer safety, and enhancing public legitimacy and partnerships. I'll just speak to a few of those issues. Um, I think we'll see at the end of the, uh, towards the end, I think in chapter six of the, of the white paper, talks about a state of the policing report. Uh, and I think that that's uh, really a, a good idea, a good initiative to start framing where are we? Because I think when you're talking about identifying key policy issues that need to help frame the police's direction, uh, you need to get a good sense of where are we now so that we know what are the next steps to go to where we want to be. Uh, and fortunately in South Africa there's a really vast amount of work being done on the police. I've just mentioned a few uh, documents that are actually official government documents um, or formal uh, judicial inquiry documents that will provide a, a very solid foundation for thinking through uh, where are we now and for looking at what kind of assessments I think need to be undertaken if, to, to help um, inform us better of where we need to, to, what we need to be addressing. Okay, I think from our perspective, the issue of uh, leadership is probably absolutely critical in all policing agencies around the world. It's, it's the topic of thousands of studies internationally because police as paramilitary organizations really do, uh, their tone, the ethos, how they understand themselves is set by the most powerful police officials. They, um, they have the most power in the organization, they should be the role models and determine how the rest of police officers behave uh, or uh, engage in their work. And we're very happy to see in the white paper itself, it says that uh, policing in the 21st century requires astute leadership and management who strive towards enhancing and building legitimacy and trust of the institution in the eyes of whom they serve and that police leadership and management must ensure a clear normative standard of the highest quality. And I think that's a very important uh, early statement about police leadership. I'm just quoting from the white paper on page 18. And of course, the National Development Plan also seems to, uh, well, certainly highlights this issue um, and 
points to a serial crisis of top management that seems to be uh, having a negative impact on the, on the organization and talks about an assessment of that in the various ways that that affects police culture and subcultures. Um, just to put a quote there from the South African Human Rights Commission's uh, final heads of uh, argument before the Marikana Commission, where they say police supervisors at any level need to be aware that their behavior has a strong impact on organizational culture, which in turn contributes to police behavior in itself. So if you really think about police reform, if you're thinking about moving the South African police service forward, I think the first place to start is the leadership, because from there on, they provide the framework, the plans, um, the ethos and the morale for the rest of the organization to follow. Um, and I think we, we've seen, and this has been mentioned before in this committee, that there are too many, the situation with too many senior SAPS managers um, for over the last decade or so have been appointed irregularly, um, do not possess the necessary skills, expertise for the post they hold, uh, found to have been untruthful in various boards of inquiry and internal processes, or facing various allegations, investigations, um, or being prosecuted. And of course, uh, when I'm talking about, I'm talking about top managers, so we're really looking at sort of the top echelon which really is, consists of lieutenant generals and major generals and, of course, uh, brigadiers. I think one of the things that the White Paper would like to see is a, is a really kind of solid set of instructions or, or direction on how to ensure that only appropriately skilled and experienced and honest people are appointed to these senior positions and provide some kind of guidance as to how police integrity can be maintained uh, when serious allegations emerge against police officials. Ideally, you don't want any serious allegations to ever emerge against your top um, echelon because the process of getting to the top echelon will weed out bad apples. Uh, being appointed means you've been properly vetted, you have a long outstanding career that people know that you have integrity, there's no question about your integrity before you're even appointed into those, that top management. So I think that's an, a, a cru crucial I issue that needs to be addressed. Of course we think the national development plan recommendations uh, are a very good foundation and could be expanded on, I think I briefly mentioned this to before this committee before. Um, that um, when you're looking at sort of assessing what's well, starting at the top, you really need to do that top echelon. And it won't take that long, because you're talking literally of about um, a couple of dozen lieutenant generals and about 50 major generals. Um, so if you start at that, that sort of top group of about 70, if you could really put the best possible men and women, and we have many in the South African Peace Service, and there really many are, so that I think an assessment of many of your lieutenant and major generals would, would establish those that are doing the jobs correctly, you wouldn't have to replace all of them, um, maybe not even most of them. Um, but that's such an assessment of them would certainly enhance their authority. Those that were illegally appointed or do not have the required skills and integrity to be in those posts could be uh, redeployed elsewhere and those posts fall in a competitive way. So that you really set, you start off your police reform moving into the next five years or into achieving the NBDP recommendations and the vision of the White Paper with a very strong senior management team that the police trust, that the public trust, and there's never any question about their integrity and what they're trying to achieve. Um, and so I think, you know, one of the things as well is that when allegations do emerge against them, it is important that those allegations can be very quickly investigated, fairly, thoroughly, for two reasons. One, so that if there is a senior manager who has been involved in misconduct or is there's questions about integrity um, and that there's evidence to back that up, they can be removed to, to, to limit the damage that that would do to the organization. But two, if they are falsely accused, which also happens in policing, that they can be cleared quite quickly. You don't want your senior managers being suspended un un unnecessarily or having questions about their, their integrity. Um, so we would like to see the, the, so the white paper really sort of giving some very really clear directions. For example, you know, if there's a ruling by a court or official uh, body that raises in questions the integrity of a South African Police Service senior commander under oath, that there's an immediate suspension and that the independent industry process isn't completed within 30 days, there should be a specific dedicated unit to dealing with very senior uh, allegations against people and should consist of investigators from not only in the police but possibly outside the police, like the RPID, Public Service Commission and others, just to make sure that there's no question that, that the outcome of investigation um, can be agreed to by all parties. Um, the other issue that we, we think that is important is that it's protecting police operational independence. Um, you know, it's, it's, we've, and this really kind of got raised in the Marikana Commission that found that very senior commanders were taking irrelevant political considerations into, to, to, into their decision-making processes, which in, impacted on the ability to make an operational decision, resulting in a reckless plan and unnecessary deaths. Uh, this issue has been given some consideration to many in other policing jurisdictions around the world. Um, and uh, one, of the, one of the sort of uh, ways of doing it to make sure that, that you maintain the, per, the, the operational independence from political interference 
is that any political office bearer who gives any instruction or guidance to the National Commission or any police officer has to do that in writing and that that gets reported on before Parliament twice a year or once a year. Um, anything else is considered either an illegal instruction or um, an instruction that's not binding in any way. Um, and if any other, and police officials could be, they're the ones reporting, so they could say, well, this is what I've received. And they, if, they, if, the, if the political official does not give it to them in writing, they write a down report on it. It's just a way of ensuring that only legal instructions and guidance are ever given, that they're within the law, within the Southern Code of Conduct. Um, and that is also about improving the legitimacy of the police amongst all sectors of the population. For political parties change over time, but the police must always be seen to be always acting in the, in the interest of the total population, not treating anybody unfairly. So we think that is something that could really strengthen operational independence if that was uh, in the white paper and that was given expression in the new South African Police Service Act. Um, of course, the anti-corruption uh, issue is quite big. Um, there's a lot of uh, media, regular media reports of police involved in crime and corruption. It really undermines the organization and really makes it more difficult for those many honest and hardworking men and women in, in, our, in blue uniforms to do their job. Um, so I think, and the, the, and the reality is the Southern Police Service has got an anti-corruption strategy in place. They've actually had many strategies over the years. But I think one of the things really is now is we've got to see implementation and the impact of these strategies. So perhaps rather than reinventing the wheel, just saying let's see um, how this strategy is implemented. The measurable indicators must be presented before the Minister, the Secretariat and Parliament on what's been implemented. Uh, so we can see that it actually is being implemented. We get a sense that uh, many aspects of that strategy are simply not being implemented at the moment. Um, and that there is a, at least an annual uh, evaluation of some sort to see what is the impact. So how far have you implemented the strategy and are we getting the kind of desired impact? So that we can, if the strategy is not working or there are new ways of dealing with new technologies, those can be inculcated on an annual basis. But really to give a sense of um, that we're trying to improve the integrity. And of course, honest uh, police professionals have absolutely nothing to worry about any kind of integrity or anti-corruption strategy. Three areas just to, that should really be of particular focus is promoting ethical decision-making and conduct. So f tackling corruption can't rely only on negative aspects like discipline and, and, and criminal charges against police officers. It starts with really encouraging an environment in which police officials know that if they are honest uh, and they act honest and they make good decisions, they will be recognized, rewarded, and they will move up the organization have a long and fruitful career in the South African Police Service, whereas those that don't uh, could find their careers incredibly limited or limiting. And of course, uh, one of the uh, often neglected areas of anti-corruption strategies is, is public involvement, making sure the public know that there is such a strategy, what it contains, um, so that they realize themselves that you, know, you don't bribe police officials, this is how you report it, bad policing, but this is also how you recognize and support good policing without necessarily uh, giving a police officer what could be construed as to be a bribe or some kind of payment. Um, Around the professional, promoting professional police conduct, I think uh, you know, the reality of policing is that uh, your senior commanders and that, that are running stations are often in stations, behind desks, doing a lot of paperwork. Um, your lower-ranking lower supervisors are out in the streets, but your biggest source of information about whether your police are, are doing good or bad work and have police and public legitimacy is from the public. So fundamentally, any police management uh, or all police managers should really want to have a user-friendly uh, complaints and compliments mechanism that is easy to use, that it's anonymous, so that they can get as much information about good and bad policing practices as possible. Um, that information needs to be centralized, and I think one of the things that we've seen is that it's not centralized in the police at the moment, it exists in different places and is dealt with differently. And the reason is so that underlying trends and patterns can be identified. Typically and currently, the way that police uh, understand a complaint is that there's a complaint against a single officer relating to service delivery or, or misconduct or criminality, and then the investigation looks to see if we can support, find evidence to support that, and the case is either substantiated or, it's, or, it's act, or unsubstantiated and it's closed. But if you're just gathering all this information, you can actually start saying, well, we have a problem with detectives at the following areas. Uh, we have problems with visible policing in the following areas. Is it about training? Is it about supervision? Are they getting enough support? You know, you'll start looking at the kinds of things that you need to change at a policy and management level to sort of support good policing and, 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 and limit bad policing. And you can't do that if the, if the systems aren't centralized, if the information is sporadic, and you're approaching um, certainly complaints from the police, uh, from the public against the police as sort of individual cases rather than a part of an, a systemic insight into policing. Okay, and once again, it's, it's a, I always would like to emphasize it's not about punishing police officers. You'll never solve corruption or police criminality through trying to get rid of what's called bad apples. Um, it's about a fundamental ethos. Police officials have to be their own guardians. 
The biggest threat to a corrupt cop must be an honest cop. Um, because honest cops have power in the organization, they have authority and the support from the public and the, org and the organization itself, not the other way around. Unfortunately, too often in many policing agencies, that's the reality. Okay, just on training, um, we really think that the, although the training courses, the curriculums and that are, are generally good standard, there seems to be a challenge in the way that these training courses are often presented. And we also are concerned about the impact the training has, whether it's actually providing sufficient skills for police officers to confidently do their, their jobs in very difficult circumstances. So we really think that there needs to be an uh, annual independent assessment of training, not just um, to ensure that the curriculums itself are in line with best practices internationally and with the white paper and others, but also that the trainers themselves are doing the right job. Uh, we have repeatedly over the years been given uh, police officers telling us that um, if they fail things, they get the answers read out to them that basically it's, it's, it's not exactly, they're not well assessed, there are a lot of problems there. Um, but if there was, an, and it's because there's no independent assessment. The training environment is under pressure to have so many people go through these and be passing these courses, and there's an incentive then to make sure that you pass your entire class. Um, that's not the objective of training. The objective of this training is to make sure that when we give a human, uh, one of our officers a firearm and put them in a very difficult community situation, that they have the skills and the confidence to deal with what they're faced with because they've been well trained and that training has impact on them. And if we just sausage machining cops through training programs, it's not gonna do that. Um, and of course, very importantly, that no officer should be appointed to any rank or promoted until they have received and been assessed on the training for, and for the skills for that rank and post. And for many years, you've seen police officials being promoted and then receiving training for that post two years down the line, um, by which case they've already established a range of acting in that position um, and might be resistant to, to, the, to the skills that are needed. Okay, officer safety, this is a very topical issue. We, we, we are also very concerned about that. When police feel that they're under attack and are under attack, it really um, it strengthens what's called the, the code of silence, brings police officials together. It's difficult to then to segregate good policing from bad policing. Um, we have uh, seen in recent weeks uh, uh, quite a few increase, well, I think six or seven um, deaths of police officials, which is, 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 is really quite shocking in that period of time, and it looks like that this year's death rate is going to be higher than last year's. I've just put the slide up here to show you that um, there has been incredible improvements in officer safety over the years, and it's because of a lot of work in the past. Once again, we don't need to reinvent the reel on this stuff. I think we do need to, however, up start updating some of the, um, the research into this kind of thing. Um, because we are likely to see that the limits to this decline in police murders has been reached. And the reason I say that it's because of the, the, the two years, of, or probably well, like to a third year now, of um, violent robberies across the country. So pretty much between 2011, uh, 12, 2013, 14, last year, 50 more armed attacks every single day on the streets of South Africa in people's homes and businesses. Okay. And if you look at the, the deaths of the police officials in the last week or so, um, they'll probably be engaging with guys who are armed because they're out to commit robberies. And they will see a cop or a police official approaches them and they immediately open fire. So this increase in robberies is contributing to the increase in murders. Uh, for the last two years, we've seen four additional murders a day, every day on average in South Africa. Uh, so our police are now, we're, starting to see, we're very likely to see this increase in policing, and it's because of this increase in armed robberies and access to firearms. Um, and that has to be addressed with, uh, that's a fundamental part of police officer safety. So it's, it's not just about um, making sure the police shoot first, uh, officer safety needs to be seen in a much more integrated manner. The one aspect uh, is ensuring that supervisors in police stations are given some kind of training to assess when their, uh, their, the people that they have responsibility over are behavior is starting to change. Coming late, using alcohol, absent without leave, being able to identify that there might be a problem and that's the issue so that you prevent the kinds of um, tragic scenes you've seen where police officials are under massive stress facing, uh, uh, because of the trauma they face in their work, um, can either commit suicide or, or harm their colleagues and their fam friends and families. And of course, providing increased access to psychological and social support. I think these things are really emphasized um, in, the, in the policy. And then once again, the firearm and SWAT training, I think that if you want to start prioritizing areas for policing training, that's probably where it is right now. Uh, because police, if they feel confident, know how to use their weapons correctly, have the right uh, uh, SWAT training skills, they won't, be able to, they won't misuse force and they will be able to deal with, protect themselves more effectively. And of course, we're talking about most police officials who are murdered on duty or killed with firearms. Um, and the issue of firearms is crucial in trying to reduce not only or improve officer safety, but community safety as well. Most of these robberies are put into um, certainly all the, most of the house robberies, business robberies, carjackings, small attacks are because of firearms. 
uh, and we need to control both legal and illegal firearms if we're actually going to get on top of um, the crime problem. We've just completed a three-year study of repeat violent offenders in our maximum, in various maximum security uh, prisons, and one factor that really changes somebody from being a petty criminal into a serious violent criminal is access to a firearm. And a lot of those firearms are legal firearms that they've stolen or got access. And when they get that firearm, you see, a, if you track their life histories, you see a massive increase in the number of crimes they commit and the extent of, of, of damage they can do. So it is something that we must give a lot of focus to. I think just on the issue around when we see um, police feeling that they're coming under attack and there's this, often this sense that they must um, be more tough, they must, be, they must shoot first, and that's where a lot of the shoot to kill stuff comes from. Um, we really actually need a different kind of message coming from, to our police, that there's no trade-off between human rights oriented, professional, community oriented policing and either their safety or their effectiveness in fighting crime. The more violent police become, the more at risk they are because they alienate themselves from the public who start seeing them as violent and don't want to support them, and the less effective they are in fighting crime because people don't give them information they need. Um, so we really need to, at these difficult times, emphasize that if you promote a community oriented policing so that they build their trust and legitimacy in the communities, uh, when they are attacked, it would be riskier for those that attack them because there would be more public outrage. People will be upset that the police officers are attacked because they recognize the value they play, the role they play in their communities, more likely to report on people who are attacking police officials, more likely to come to an officer's safety if they've been attacked, um, and provide demonstrable support, and uh, that in its time will lead to better information coming from the communities and that. So if we have a situation where police feel under attack and it's told, you must shoot first, and they start feeling that gives them a license to, to become more violent, it could have the opposite effect of, of decline, uh, decreasing their, their safety. So the more professional they are, the more legitimate, the more likely they'll be safe. Okay, then finally, um, just on the issue of, of building partnerships, the foundation of partnerships between the police obviously is trust and dealt with that within the leadership issue, but it's also about information and sharing information. I think uh, South Africa is fortunate enough to have a lot of different organizations, universities and others who, who do different work on crime and can assist the police in various ways. But at the moment, it is difficult to find a way of, of, of promoting and sharing information. Um, so we do think that there would be useful, a practical recommendation here is to set up sort of police public sharing information structures, could be one at national level and one in each province. Uh, and really the purpose would be to improve the public understanding of how the police and policing works in South Africa. People don't always understand issues around policing. Um, so people who could make access, use of these structures could be the media, could be researchers, could be NGOs, could be anybody working in the community that wants to know how to to ensure that their communities understand policing better. It could promote consensus on the key crime and policing challenges. Right now, it is a situation which the South African Police Service kind of do their planning on their own, um, and there's very little really consultation about that, which means you have police plans that often don't reflect what people so say are concerning, concerning them. Um, and if you had that structure where people could say, well, these were, well, this is what's concerning us, this is what the police are concerned, you know, you'd have a consensus around the police planning process about what needs to be done and how to fix those things. And of course, the more people involved and who are aware of what needs to be done, the more support you get for these initiatives. Um, and then you can coordinate practical multifaceted solutions. And of course, for us, uh, these are just some areas uh, that we think are, are, are useful, but there are a lot more other ways of information. But basically, the crime stats, we say per month, um, simply because if a community suddenly finds that there's a lot of houses being hit by armed robbers or uh, street robberies taking place in an area, they uh, first of all, identify that's happening very quickly. If they are then able to put in measure, place measures, they will then the next month see if they're having an impact or not. Um, some stations give some information, some statistics to certain limited amounts of people. Uh, but you can't expect the police to be the custodian of all crime information. If this stuff was on the, uh, on the police website, and it could be updated every month quite easily, the audited statistics would come up, would be released once a year at a national release, which is absolutely fine. Um, but we haven't seen massive discrepancies between audited and unaudited statistics to the point that they would really fundamentally shift your understanding of whether crime's going up or down in any place. Um, so that would be one very useful uh, approach. It's almost low-hanging fruit um, because we could start, we'd all be starting on a base of knowledge of what's going up, uh, what's going down in our communities. And right now that information is simply just not there and it's leading to, it contributes to vigilantism, it cont contributes to a sense of distrust in the police and that kind of thing. Okay, and then just about you know, general information about the piece and so forth. So uh, I'll take any more time. I'll stop there. But thank you very much for your um, indulgence. Thank you very much. I think what we will do, we will break now for tea for the next 15 minutes, and then we'll come back for interaction with Dr. Hume. Thank you very much. 15 minutes, colleagues. Thank you.